Okay. Um, one thing that I got to say here at the beginning is this whole business about, what, especially what we're going to be talking about merging and sorting, is not something that comes naturally to people. I will tell you that right now. I was wondering, do I really have to explain what a merge is? And then I realized, yes, I do, because I have met people who did not know what either they didn't have never done a merge before or they did it, but they didn't know that it had a name. And I'd have definitely met people who did not know how to sort things into alphabetical order. And I had to teach them how to do it. You had to learn it at one point, but you've done it so long ago that you've forgotten that you had to learn it. So I have to keep reminding myself that even though this, this is going to be old news to a lot of people, it's worth repeating it anyway. And especially for those who have never done it or again, who have done it, but didn't know it had a name. So in general, how do we merge two lists? Okay, we have two lists that are already sorted and we want to combine them into one list here at, at the top. And the I don't know if it's the best way to do it, but a very straightforward way of doing it is we're going to compare the first items from both lists. Well, which one is less? The two is less than the four and that means that the smaller one moves to the merged list and then we move to the next item in that list. Now we have another pair of candidates to compare with one another, four versus 40. Four is a smaller number, so it moves into the merged list and we move the right-hand side forward. Then we look at the next available item in both lists. Now we're comparing 10 against 40. Who's the winner? Remember, we want them in to be in, in ascending order. So who's, who's going to go into the, the result list next? The 10 or the 40? The 10 is going to go in, correct? That's what I mean by the winner. Okay, so 10 wins in this case. And now 10 is greater than 40, so it moves to the merge list. And we, again, move forward in that list. So now we have 11 against 40. Which one's smaller? 11. And so 11 moves into the um, result. And we advance the right-hand position. Now we have 40 versus 217. 40 is smaller. So we move it into the merge list and then move the pointer on the right-hand side saying we we're on, on to the next candidate. We have 47 versus 217. 47, again, is the smaller one. So it goes in and we advance to 66. And then we compare 66 with 217, 66 goes in and now we are out of the first list there's nothing left to compare whenever we hit the end of one of the lists and you're guaranteed to hit one of them before the other one we'll use a loop to move the remaining items from the other list into the merged list so we just run out the other list so whichever list is left over we run it out into the result list and that's how you do a, a, a standard merge. Um, so here's the pseudocode. We're going to set the index for list A and the index for list B to zero. As long as they are both in bounds, namely we haven't run out of one list or the other. If the item from A is less than the one in B, then A goes into the result and we add one to index A. Otherwise, then B must be the smaller or equal. If they're equal, it doesn't matter which one we take. So we may as well take it from list number B. And then add one to index B. So there's the thing that happens as long as we still have candidates in both lists. As soon as one of them goes out of bounds, then only one of them will have things left. We'll run out all the remaining elements in A and then we'll run out all the remaining elements in B. Um, this loop will succeed, by the way. This will not crash our program. Why? Because let's say we ran out of, in fact, in this example, we ran out of things in the first list, correct? That means index A will be equal to A dot length, and that means this will be false immediately, and the body of this loop will never execute. Remember, a while loop can do nothing at all. 
and we're depending on that so it will work elegantly. We can run out both lists and the empty one will do nothing. The one that still has elements in it will get moved in. And I'm missing a closing curly brace. I think it's because I ran out of room on the slide. And in fact, um, here is essentially that code. Yeah. And here we're running. Oh, there's something interesting here. Are you all familiar with what this means here? With the plus pluses here? Or is this something that looks new to you? Okay, this is new. Okay, good. You know what the plus plus does, correct? It adds one, okay? And this is because it comes after the variable name. We look at the index first and then we increment it afterwards. So this is exactly the same thing as saying result of result index becomes list sub i. And then we say i becomes i plus one. And then um, result index becomes result index plus one. Huh. Essentially, the addition takes place after we look at what's in i. So it's very important to understand that it's coming afterwards. So rather than having to write three lines, I can write it in one line. And you will see this all the time if you're, especially if you're programming in a language called C or C++, they use this all the time. It's very common to see this um, notation. So get used to seeing it. Again, you don't have to know, that's one of these things like in a foreign language, when you're learning it, there are certain expressions. You have to understand what they mean, but you'll never have to say them yourselves unless you want to. This is one of them. You have to understand that this is the same as this. But if you aren't care, or I say, if you aren't comfortable with writing it this way, you can always write it as three separate statements. Now, when the plus plus comes before the variable name, totally different rules, and I'm not going to go into big long exposition on that but i did want to point out that i'm using this because i was too lazy to write three statements so now we know what a merge is so is everybody happy with the merge process i have two lists i had to look at the first the next uh, candidate in both lists and figure out which one goes into the result move forwards and then when i'm done Okay, great. Well, how does this help us? The problem is these are already sorted. How did we get here in the first place? And that's what the merge sort does. We're going to have a sorting process that uses this merging business. And like an idiot, I forgot to open that. Um, let's see, merge sort.odp. There we go. Okay, so here we are with the merge sort. So here's a bunch of numbers. They are definitely not in order. Here's what the plan's gonna be. We're gonna divide the long list into two shorter sublists, the left half and the right half. Then we're gonna sort the left half and then sort the right half. Then we'll have two sorted lists, right? Oh, good, we can merge them back into a longer list. The same way I did in that previous slide presentation. Great. Uh, how do we do this step? And the answer is, we're going to do a merge sort on each sub list, and that's recursion. So I'm going to split this list into the left half and the right half. Then when I want to sort this left half, I'll sort it into another left and right half. Now, the question is, whenever I have recursion, I've got a base case. Otherwise, I'm going to be subdividing forever. The answer to the base case is going to be a list of length one. It's sorted already, okay? <laughs> is this list in order? Uh, yeah, it's the only thing. Okay, And we can't subdivide it anymore anyway. You can't divide into a left half and a right half. Yeah, I know you could have a six and a six, but don't, don't get me started, okay? That's just foolish. So there's our base case. So let's go through this step by step. We're going to take the left half of the list and we're going to sort it. 
Oh, dang, we're not at our base case yet. Okay, so let's sort the left half of that list. Well, damn, we're still not down to one element. So let's sort this left half. Finally, we've got a, a one that we can sort. Yay, 66 is sorted already. Now we can go on to the right half of this list, which is the 10, and it sorts into 10. Now we have two lists that are in sorted order, aren't they? Great. Now we'll merge them and we get the 10 and the 66 with our merge method. Do you need me to go over that section again? Do you want me to go over that again? You okay with this? Yeah. So now I've got my two element list. And now I'm going to have to sort the right half of four. I've, I've sorted the 66 and 10. That get out to 10, 6, 6. Now I have to sort 47, 11. And, okay. Left half is already a sorted list. Right half is already sorted. And now I merge the 47 and 11. And when I merge them, I get 11, 47. Great. Now I've done both halves of this list. I have two sorted sublists, and now I know they're sorted. And I can now merge those together into that. Do you see how this is? It's very nice, nice, nicely elegant to be able to do it this way. Great. Now I've done all of the left half of my main list. Now I have to sort the right half of the list. Okay. Again, I'm going to start with the left half of that, which is the 40 and 505. That results in two one-item lists. And they merge back because they're already in order. Then similarly, I'm going to have my 54 and 217. The 217 54 is going to split into this and merge back into that. I didn't want to have to do a million slides here. So. But again, it's the same process. I keep doing it in, in, in decrements of one half, so to speak, until I get to single items and I merge back up the chain. Now I have those two sorted halves and they get merged. And again, those are now in order. Now I have two sorted sublists, which is exactly what I need. And I do one final merge and everything's back in order. So by using recursion and saying, well, merge the left half and then merge the right half and then merge those two together. It just all works out very nicely. And that completes the sort. So again, let's look at the merge. I had one, by the way, I'm going to upload these both um, with the debugging and also without the debugging. Let's run this one. L let me show you the one without the debugging and show you what it looks like. So I'm going to have, oh, this is different than the one in the book. Very important. Remember how the one in the book was copying the arrays? Uh, let me bring that up here and see if I can find it. Here, they've created a brand new array called copy of range from zero to middle and then from the middle to the um, length. And then they did a merge sort of those two arrays and then they created a brand new array for the merged result. And so there's a whole bunch of copying going on. Um, I modified that. And again, I will put this up online and you will be able to use this if you want to in the assignment. So you can either use the one from the book or you can use this one here. And my merge sort is going to call the merge helper method. I'll give it the list. And here is the starting point and the ending point. This is the subsection of the array that I would like to sort. And, and it sort of merges the elements from start up to, but not including end. And you have no, the, the reason this debugging has so much crap in it is because I had forgotten to keep track of, okay, does the end mean the last item or one plus the last item? 
Is it, is it including or not including that end item? And I was getting just all sorts of, you know, index out of bounds exceptions. And then I finally said, okay, I'm going to make up my mind that it's going to be not including the end. That's my decision. I'm going to stick with it. So sometimes you have to make a decision. You have to make sure that you always keep track of it. Otherwise, you get what is called the off by one error. You either count one too many or count one too few, and you always get the bad results when you are off by one. So if I have more than one item, then I find the middle item and I go from the start up to, but not including the middle. And then I insert, sort the list from the middle up to, but not including the end, because remember the end is one past, past the boundary. And then I have my indexes I and J and the result array. I have to create a new array. So one th bad thing about the merge is merge sort requires you to um, have a bit of extra storage for the intermediate results. When you merge, you cannot do a merge sort in place easily. You need some extra storage to store the result. And then again, as long as I still have room on both of these, I compare them and move the one that is less. And then I run out the remaining elements. And then I have to move the result back into the original area of the list where it came from. So there is some copying being done, but I would have had to do it anyway. And I put some duplicates in there, by the way, just to check to see that it would handle those properly. And yes, it does. Um, let me run it with the debugging output. I've got a whole bunch of stuff in here that will help me know what's going on. So here I was my list that I was sorting. I'm going to sort the sublist from 0 to 11. The middle is 5. That means I'm going to have to sort this sublist, which goes to 1066, which goes to 10, and then 66. I merge them back. Then the lateral right half is 47, 11, 505. And that gets merged into that eventually. So you can see all the steps that it was taking and which subsections of the list were being handled at what time. So this might be useful for you to look at so you can, again, see what the flow is. I'm also going to be uploading the um, slides, by the way. So that's merge sorts. So now you know what merging is, and now you know how merging helps you do a, a sort. And I that's an order n log n. You have log to the base n passes because each pass is half as many items. But each pass requires order in um, comparisons and moves, and therefore it's n log n. Can we improve on this? Yes, in fact, there is. We can use what's called the quick sort. Quick sort is also n log n performance, but it has a lot fewer copies and comparisons. And it's a little bit trickier to understand. So let's go and look, look at that. Here's our list that we want to sort out. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to choose, choose something called the pivot element. And just for this example, we're going to always use the first item in the list as our pivot. Then we're going to divide the element list into all the elements less than the pivot and all those that are greater than or equal to the pivot. Okay. For example, if let's say I had a bunch of registration cards from people at some event, and they were in no particular order and I wanted to alphabetize them, well, I might say, okay, M is my pivot element. Everything from A through L is going to go into one pile. Everything from M through Z is going to go into the next pile. And now at least I have a, I now have two things to do, and they might not be equal size, by the way. 
unlike merge sort where they were always going to be half. Yeah, I could have very few people in A through M and a lot of people in M through Z. It's In fact, they aren't evenly distributed. Yeah. And then what I could do is I could take the A through L pile and I could say, okay, let's choose F as my pivot point. And then everything A through E goes into one pile and F through L goes into that other pile. Then I'd end up with piles that are small enough that I can reasonably sort them quickly. And then I could put them back together. So we'll quick sort each of the sublists. And then we'll be done. That's the recursion. This one, we don't have to create a brand new array to hold the result. There's no merging going on. This is all going to be done by moving things around. But the trick here is going to be dividing the list into all the elements less than the pivot and those greater than or equal to the pivot element. So let's see how this works. We're going to choose our first item as the pivot. Then we're going to set an index to the left and right elements of the rest of the list. Again, the book isn't going through this, but they just give you a diagram. I want to show you this happening step by step. Yeah. What we now want to do is we are now going to move this left mark forward until we get to a value that's greater than or equal to the pivot. Because that means we're going to have something that's in the wrong place. Yeah. 87 is where we stop. Now we have the left mark. Now we're going to take the right mark and we're going to move it backwards until we get to a value that's less than the pivot element. Because the pivot element is going to go somewhere here in the middle. And the 87 is definitely not going to be the left of 50. And the 8 is definitely not going to be to the right of 50. Wherever 50 happens to end up. So now we have to stop both left mark and right mark. And these are clearly on the wrong sides of the pivot. Let's say the 50 was supposed to go here. Well, 87 couldn't go to the left, and 8 sure as heck couldn't go to the right. So that means these are in the wrong order. We're going to exchange the values. Now we go through the process again. We're going to move the left mark forward until you get to something that's greater than the pivot, because, again, it's in the wrong place. Now I'm going to take the right mark and move it backward until I get to value less than the pivot. And then, since these are clearly in the wrong order, I have to exchange their values. I go through the process again. I'm going to move forward until I get to a value greater than or equal to the pivot, which is going to be 90. And then I'm going to take my right mark and move it backwards until I get to something that is less than the pivot, which ends up at 12. Now, the left and right mark have just crossed over one another, and that means I am, I'm finished. There's no need for me to go any further. I know what has to happen now. And what has to happen now is as soon as the right mark gets less than the left mark, that's our split point. That's where we're going to be splitting our list. That's where the pivot belongs. That's its final, final location. We'll move the 50 and the right mark, and now the pivot is in the correct place. Everything less than 50 is on the left of the pivot. Everything bigger than 50 is on the right-hand side of the pivot. Now I'm going to quick sort the elements that are less, and then I'm going to quick sort the elements that are on the right. I'm separating these a little bit visually so you can see them. And again, we're going to just do this exact same process. We're going to choose the first one as our pivot, just because it's an easy choice. And we're going to set our left and right marks. The left is already greater than or equal to the pivot, so we don't have to move it forward. The right moves back until it gets to something less than 12, so it has to move back. We'll exchange them. Now we're going to move the left mark forward until we get to a value that's greater than or equal to the pivot. And we move the right mark backwards, and they've crossed over. That means the 12 has to go here. This is where the 12 really belongs. That's our split point. And sure enough, that's where it goes. Now, everything to the left of the pivot is less than 12. 
everything to the right of the pivot is greater than 12. And now we give another left and right half to quicksort. And the quicksort of the eight will give us the eight. The quicksort of 36 and 42 will eventually end up as 36 and 42. And we continue that process. That's how quicksort works. Um, where was that thing that I had before here? X. When they do the quick sort. Okay. Um, they copy the pivot element. They're, they're doing it slightly differently. I don't think they're doing it recursively. They're doing it iteratively. So what you're seeing here is, I think, an iterative solution rather than a recursive solution. But the recursive solution is just more elegant. But you can step through this and you can see how they do it in an iterative manner. I'll take a look at the code for this anyway. So there's the main sort itself. I partitioned the um, list from the first element to the last element, and that's my split point. And then I quick sort the list from first up to where the split point was. And then I sort the point from the split point plus one to the end. I don't have to sort the split. The split itself is not in there because we know it's in the correct position. Again, whenever you hit your split point, wherever that pivot lands up, that's where it's going to be in the final list. Now, why that is the case and how that is mathematically guaranteed, don't ask me. I cannot give you a proof of it. Okay, I can explain what is happening, but I can't explain how it was derived. Okay. That, that's just the way it goes. And here again is our partitioning. We take the first value in the list and then we set the left mark to one past the pivot. The right mark is at the end. This, by the way, let me put this in here. Um, So remember, I did the merge sort as up to, but not including, mostly because that's the way loops normally work in Java. The way they wrote this in the book, they decided we're going to go from the first up to and including the last index. So they made a different decision and they decided they were going to stick with it. And I don't care which decision you make, as long as you make a decision and you stay with it and are consistent. And here's the partitioning. And there's a lot of compound conditioning to make this work. So as long as the left mark is less than or equal to the right mark, and the left mark in the thing at the left mark is less than the pivot value, that means I have to keep going because I haven't found one that's greater than the pivot. And similarly here, as long as I haven't crossed over and the right mark is looking at something that's bigger than the pivot value, I have to keep moving backwards. So that's the code for what I said when I was doing the demonstration. If the right mark is less than the left mark, we're, we're finished. We've got our split point. Otherwise, we have to exchange these. And I'm just doing this as long as I'm not finished. That is the easiest way to do it. I, I, there may be an easier way to express this in Java, but this is the first way that I thought of doing it that works. And Oh, no, the book did it. Yeah, the book was originally in Python. I don't know if I, I don't know how I translated it into Java. I know this is my code. I'm going to have to look at the original Python and see how they did it. That'd be really interesting to see, to see if they did it similar to the way I did or something totally different. And then at any rate, as soon as we're done with this loop, remember we found the split point and 
that goes into the right mark. And we exchange the pivot. Again, one of the nice things about Quickstore, it's very compact to implement if you do it recursively. Doing it iteratively, I have no idea what a mess it might be to implement Quicksort, but recursively, it just all falls into place. And there it is. Oh, this is interesting. I don't have any duplicates in here. Hmm. Want me to put some duplicates in here and see what it does? Might as well. Uh, let's put another 54, 10, and put in another 17. And the answer is, yeah, it works. Okay, so this takes care of duplicate entries just fine. So that is your quick sort. Um, Professor, do you have anything to add on this? No, well, I just want to say that you know, Merce sort and Quick sort are really useful for students for learning a lot. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing here. Hold on, let me boost my volume here. Yeah, I just want to say that Quick sort and Merce sort are extremely useful. Those are used a lot um, for sorting. Okay, yeah, they, they, those are indeed, so those, those are very commonly used. Um, there is something I want to talk about, though, here, and that is, let's, let's take a look at this. The choice of your pivot really becomes crucial when you're doing a um, quick sort. If you have a completely sorted list, the performance of quick sort is really terrible. I'll tell you that right now. Because if you choose your pivot as the first item, then there's nothing before the beginning and everything is after the pivot. Well, that's not going to do you much good because now you have, instead of sorting approximately half and half, you've got nothing and everything except one. And you're going to go through that same business. Also, if you have a lot of duplicate entries, then you're going to have a lot of um, extra partitioning that unfortunately will slow things down. But if things are pretty well distributed, you're going to be okay. Um, I don't know if they talk about it here or not. Yes. Yeah. So here, unfortunately, the very worst case, they may not be in the middle and they could be skewed to the left or right. Um, so you might end up with an order n squared sort. If you are, if you, if your pivots, if everything's already in order and you choose your pivots extremely badly. So one way that they would, another way to choose a um, pivot value is something called the median of three. And what we'll do is we'll take so the first, the middle, and the last element in the list. So 54, 77, and 20. And then you'll pick the median value of those three, which in this case is 54. There's the one in the middle, and that's going to be that. And the idea is that's because if the first item doesn't belong towards the middle of the list, the median chooses, chooses a better middle value. That's the idea. And this is interesting. Yeah, well, which answer shows the contents of the list after the second partitioning? Um, so you might you might want to sit down and do a partitioning by hand at least once just to see how it go, how it works. Choose a set of numbers or use a set of numbers that I had in the um, slide or this one here that they have and see what happens. See if you can figure out how the partitioning works, presuming that we use 14 as our pivot. What's it gonna look like after the first partition? And the second partition is going to be on the left half only because we do the left half first. Um, yeah. this is useful to know things like this might show up by the way on a uh, on the final exam so namely we need to know the big O for a sequential search is order n binary search is log n in the worst case and hash tables will give you constant time searching 
or near constant time searching, depending on how badly loaded your hash table is. Bubble sort selection and insertion sort are all order n squared, but bubble sort is the worst because it does an infinite number of compare of swaps compared to the selection sort and the insertion sort. Uh, so shell sort will sort incremental sublists. So it's between order n and order n squared. Merge sort is always guaranteed to be n log n, but you need the additional space for the merging. So and this is a classic trade-off. It's time versus memory. I can trade time off guaranteed n log n, but I'm going to need some extra memory. So if I'm tight on memory, maybe I don't want to use a merge sort. And whereas if I am um, have lots of memory, then, and I need to get it done fast, merge sort might be exactly what I need. Yeah. And quick sorts n log n, but it may degrade to n squared if you're not near the middle of the list and it does not require any additional space. I never had to merge anything when I was doing quick sort. All I had to do was move stuff around. Um, in fact, here on the quick sort, let's do 10 arrays with 10,000. And let's run that. And just see what happens on this. And so we can we can take a comparison to see what happens. So bubble sort took seven seconds. Uh, let's try insert selection sort. We're going to have the same number of comparisons, but a lot less, fewer copies. Insertion sort. We have a lot fewer comparisons, but a lot more copies. But again, copies are in a... Copies are less expensive than swaps, so we're good. We're good. The merge sort has not many comparisons and not many copies compared to everybody else. And quick sort, um, in this case, came out with a few more comparisons, but a lot fewer copies. Yeah. So in general, this is what you're going to find. Unless, of course, you have a pathological case. Like if you try and do quick sort and all the values are identical. Okay, that's that's not going to be good. In that case, bubble sort would be the fastest. Because you do one pass and nothing got exchanged and you'd be finished. But that's not going to happen much in, if you're using real data. So there we are. And um, I did, let me move this up here so I can. I'm deliberately hiding this so you don't see the code. And I just wanna show you what happens when I execute this. Um, And these are in milliseconds now. It's not seconds, it's actually milliseconds. And you can see here again, the quick sort is the best, followed by merge. Shell sort is not bad. Shell sort is actually pretty darn good. And insertion sort is pretty much your worst. And when you do your assignment, try and get things lined up nicely. I mean, it'll make things more readable. Oh, that's right. I know what I was going to look up here. Um, this is the original article about quick short. And this will tell you how far things have come since, the, um, when was this done? Um, let's see. 
I don't know what the date is on this. 62, 1962. How, how far have things come along? The National LA 405 has a delay line working for 512 locations and a magnetic disk back and store of 16,384 words, where a word is, I think, like four bytes. So they had 65K bytes worth of actual disk storage on this thing, and that was considered to be one heck of a computer in its day. And if you look at the merge sort for 500 items, it took two minutes and eight seconds to sort them with merge sort and one minute and 21 seconds with quick sort. So quick sort, even back then, even with this incredibly limited machine power was still faster. But I looked at it and I said, wow, have we come a long way in the last few years. Yeah. You look at that and say, how the heck did they ever get anything done back then? So. Uh, these figures were computed by formulas that can't be achieved due to the limited storage size. So there wasn't enough storage to do a 1500 item merge. And here we are, you know, carrying around our phones with like, what, eight gigabytes of memory. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird. So uh, that may put things in, in, in perspective, although it's a rather warped perspective. I saw this, I was reading up there on the, sometimes it's nice to read the original papers where people actually developed this stuff so you can see what they were thinking and how they derived it. In fact, when he's talking about, um, you know, how the, the performance, I mean, he does all of the math that's involved, okay? You can see that for the estimation of the time taken, it's it's amazing that he actually went through from first principles and derived all of that stuff. So, okay, that does it for sorting. Um, next week we will start with chapter six tables of uh, trees, excuse me. And I have to make an executive decision here. We're going to go with six point one through six point eight. That's going to be the next week. I am strongly thinking of dropping sections 6.9, 6.10, and 6.11, the priority queues with binary heaps. I'm going to have to talk to the other professor and see if he agrees with me on that. And then the week after that, we're going to have binary search trees and AVL trees. Yeah, so that's the plan for the next couple of weeks. And then the week after that is going to be review for the final. And I will put up the topics, by the way, uh, sometime, I guess. In the, I think I'll, I'll be able to do that next week. And we'll go over those on Monday and then Wednesday is the final. So we're, we're closing in on the end of the semester here. Any questions at this point? So, okay, then I guess lab time, get to work on the sorting um assignment <laughs>